welcome you back to our study of 1 Timothy. Yesterday we had a very good start. I appreciated the opportunity to begin this study. We looked at the background of these two letters and uh, we had a chance to get an, a flavor of an understanding of who Paul is, who Timothy is. We looked at the background of the city of Ephesus and how the work in the churches began there. And just what we said, we began to build a foundation underneath what's going to become our understanding of this very important letter, actually two letters, first and second Timothy. And so we, we came away with a deeper appreciation for the work that God had already done before this letter was ever written. We found that Paul had left Timothy back in this place in the city of Ephesus to do a work that Timothy was not sure that he could handle or not sure that he could do. And in the first study that we looked at in verses 1 through 11 of chapter 1, we see Paul just admonishing Timothy, Timothy, please, you have to put an end to all the, the vain discussions and the diverse speculations that's happening from these false teachers. And so that's where we left off in our study yesterday. So with that in mind, we're going to pick up our study today with 1 Timothy chapter 1. And the section we want to look at for the next few minutes is verses 12 through verse 20. So we're going to look at the second half of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. And I want to set it up by telling you a story. Our family in our home loves the Olympics. I don't know if you watch the Olympics or have a chance to do that. We just love the Olympics. And so when the Winter Olympics are there, when the Summer Olympics are there, our television set is on and we allow ourselves to stay up late at night because we just love it. And of course, we're Americans, so we especially follow the Americans. But having a daughter who's from Russia, we like to follow the Russians as well. But I go back six years to 2004 and the Summer Olympics. And we were watching gymnastics. And the Americans had a gymnast by the name of Paul Ham. He was an excellent gymnast, and after the first couple of rounds of the gymnastics competition, he was very near first place. And so we were excited. He's going to do it. Maybe he can do it. And then the next event came, and it was the vault. And if you know what the vault is, you run down this narrow little path, you hit a little trampoline, you jump in the air, they do a flip off of the vault, and then hopefully they land squarely on their feet. Well, he's an expert, so you think, he's going to get this. This is going to be great. So he runs, and he's running down the, the, the little runway, and he jumps, and he hits the trampoline, and his hands go onto the vault, and he flips up in the air, and he lands. But instead of landing squarely on his two feet and then standing up, you can see this pained expression on his face. His legs cross, and he tips over to one side, and he falls down. In fact, he falls in such a way that he literally falls off of the landing place and he lands on the judge's table. And all of a sudden, his almost first place becomes far down the list. You go, oh, his Olympic dream is almost over. He went down to 12th place. So what is he going to do? There's still two or three events left to do. So is he going to have the, is he going to summon the strength to try this anymore? Is he just going to quit? So all of America is watching. Can Paul Ham do this? So it comes time for the next event. It's the floor exercises where this large area and they play some music and he, he struts around and he does his acrobatic exercises and he does an amazing job and he gets an excellent score and he has a little bit of hope. Maybe he, maybe he can do this. There's one event left and now he's risen from 12th place to about 4th or 5th or 6th place. And, there's, and, and the commentators are saying, can he possibly do it? Can he possibly do it? And they did all their calculations, and based on what the other athletes, the other gymnasts had done, they said, if he can get a score of 9.825, he can win. Well, if you know anything about gymnastics, 10 is perfection, and almost no one ever gets perfection. So here he is, his last event. He's just got these few seconds left to do this, and he's, he's going to go into the, the, uh, the parallel bars. And so he jumps up on, on this bar and he hangs there and he begins to swing and he swings to float and he goes over the top and he's getting stronger and he's swinging higher and he goes up and he lets go with his hands and he flips around and he comes around and again and again and there's a little bit of hope rising. Maybe he can do it. He's doing a fantastic job. And higher and higher he goes and he comes around and he catches it each time and it comes time for his dismount and he comes around and he flips and he lands, boom, on both feet and then he stands straight up. And this big smile breaks out in his face and we go, that was fantastic. 
do you suppose that maybe that was enough? So now it's time to wait for the judges. Are, are, is the score going to be good enough? And so we wait and we wait and everyone is tense and trying to figure out what his score is going to be. And finally they post it, this score and this score and this score. And they do the calculations and they say his average score, he needed 9.825. Do you know what he got? 9.837. And all of a sudden he just crumbles and we couldn't hear what he said, but we could read his lips and he said, no way, no way, no way, because he can't believe it. He's in disbelief. He has won the gold medal in the men's gymnastics competition after insurmountable odds to be able to come back and finish like he did. What Paul Ham illustrates to me is three things. That if we're going to finish well, and that's our objective, is to live the Christian life in such a way that we finish well, there are three things, and Paul Ham describes them perfectly. We must assess where we are when he got done with that disastrous vault, he had to look at himself and say, who am I? What am I capable of? Do I want to right? He assessed who he was and where he is. Number two, remember where you have come from. When Paul Ham looked at that event, he had to look back and say, I have spent years and years and years of training. Am I willing to set all of that aside and just quit? So he had to look back and see where he had come from. And third, he had to decide if he was going to be persistent enough to try to succeed. Because when you're in 12th place in the Olympics and there appears to be no hope to win, you have to find out, am I willing to fight with everything that I have left in me to try to be a success? And he did. Now, before I leave that story, there was another American gymnast in that competition. There were several others, but there was another one by the name of Brett McClure. At the end of the, the first several stages, the rotation, he had been in fourth place. But his perspective was somewhat different. You would say, he's in fourth place. He has an excellent chance to win. But when he was being interviewed, this is what he told the interviewers. These are his words. I took a picture of the scoreboard after five events because I knew that I was going to drop. And he finished in ninth place. He was in fourth. He realized there was nothing in him that could be a champion. And he said, I'm going to take a picture of that scoreboard because that's the highest I'm ever going to be. And I go, how different is his perspective from Paul Ham's? That when he assessed where he was, he looked at himself and his ability and says, I can't do this. When he looked back at his past, he said, there's nothing in my past that tells me I have a chance to be a success. And when he was looking at his ability to succeed and the persistence that it would take, he said, I don't have what it takes. And I'm going to finish wherever I can. Do you see the difference in the two people? I wonder if some people approach their Christian life the same way Brett McClure did. They say, you know, the Christian life is hard. I don't think I can do it. You know, God is God, but I don't know if He has enough strength to help me. So I'm, I'm just going to, you know, kind of just be an average Christian. And I wonder if God doesn't look at those of us who take that perspective and say, I could do so much in you. I could do so much in your churches if you would just let me work. Well, if you have a flavor for those two people, you'll begin to understand what we're about to see in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 20. Remember that we said Timothy was a very shy, rather introspective, kind of introverted young man. And Paul needed to tell him, Timothy, please, you've got to get involved in this situation. You have to try. Timothy has a chance to be either Paul Ham or Brett McClure. He's at a place where he's saying, Paul, I'm not comfortable being here. This is hard. These false teachers that are coming in and he's teaching these various things, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I'm not you, Paul. I don't have the strength that you have. I don't know what to do. And Paul writes in this letter, Timothy, because of what Jesus Christ is doing in you, you can. You need to assess where you are, Timothy. You need to remember where you've come from, and then you need to determine to have the persistence to make this work. Have you benefited from this teaching ministry? Have you found TVS videos helpful and relevant? Please consider supporting TVS with your prayers and financial gifts. 
For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. So let me read with you verses 12 through 20 of chapter 1 of 1 Timothy. This is what the, it says. I thank Him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because He judged me faithful, appointing me to His service. Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord flowed over, overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. To the King of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal. TVS.gift at gmail.com.